in, in Hello. Uh, German too. Hello, I'm Gail Summerfield, Director of Women and Gender and Global Perspectives Program, and this is Jim Barrett, Professor of History. We're co-chairing the Center for Advanced Study Initiative on Immigration, History, and Policy this year, and very glad to welcome you to our forum today. Um, the idea behind this immigration initiative is to be very broad-based and global in scope, uh, and today's forum addresses uh, those goals. We're looking at immigration policy in, in terms of different countries' perspectives, but we're also certainly very interested in examining this flow back and forth of transnational migrants uh, as we examine issues around these different topics. We're looking today for um, this to fit into a study that is broad-based over the course of this year and last year, which was a building year, so that you can't cover all topics by any means, but you can at least begin the discussion of some of the more in-depth uh, areas and introduce researchers on campus to each other. Many of you know each other already, but uh, there are a lot that are new to this area, and we hope to involve you more in this discussion also. Uh, the next speaker in the series is going to be Paul Zalesa on November 3rd, and he will be talking about Africa's new global migrations and diasporas. Uh, also at 4 p.m. and in the Spurlock Building Night Auditorium. Uh, so we hope that you'll be able to work that onto, into your busy semester as well. Uh, today, we want to have this forum to incorporate some of the researchers at the University of Illinois who've been working on these topics for different countries uh, and regions particularly, and to give opportunities to these researchers to share their work with you. We have with us today Doug Kibbe, from, who is the Director of Literature, Cultures, and Linguistics programs, or school, and also a professor in French, and he's going to look at an overview of the situation in Europe. We also have Dorte Schneider from History and Women and Gender and Global Perspectives, and she's going to look at women immigrants and immigration policy today in historical perspective. And then we have Alejandro Lugo from Anthropology and Latina Latino Studies, and he's going to talk about the social implications of recent U.S. immigration policy. So this gives us a pretty broad scope uh, internationally. Each speaker is going to talk approximately 15 minutes, uh, and then we'll have the rest of the time for some discussion and welcome your questions. So without further ado, I'm going to turn this over to Doug Kibbe. Thanks, Gail. Uh, Almost everywhere, governments and international organizations are trying to establish policies that address economic and humanitarian issues uh, concerning the movement of people across national boundaries. In the United States, we learned in a, an earlier talk in this series that there are about uh, 37 million residents who uh, were born uh, somewhere else, uh, about 12% of the population. In Europe, the numbers are generally lower, about 4% of the total of uh, 490 million residents that make up the European Union now. So today, I'm going to talk about uh, immigration policy, the general principles and guidelines that countries and international organizations have used to decide who should be allowed to enter, under what conditions, what should be done to integrate immigrants into the host society, and what should be done in concert with the country of origin to limit the pressures that lead people to migrate. Then Dorote and Alejandro uh, will talk about some specifics, focusing more on the US side. Demographics, economics, and political turmoil are the driving forces behind transnational migration, often the three combined. Countries of origin are typically overpopulated countries with high unemployment and corrupt and repressive re regimes. Demographics, economics, and politics are also factors in the host country. Aging workforces, relatively low unemployment, <coughs> democratically elected governments that more or less follow the rule of law. On the push side, per capita income in Sub-Saharan Africa, just to use an example, is about 1 30th that of Western Europe and the United States. 
Those same countries average more than 40 births per thousand, while Western Europe and the United States average about 10. And the uh, corruption index issued by Transparency International uh, ranks the countries of Africa and South America as far more politically unstable and dangerous uh, than those of the European Union or the United States. So it's no surprise that so many people want to move to improve their situation and future prospects for their children. At the same time, the aging of the workforce in Western Europe, combined with early retirement benefits, the average retirement age in the European Union is under 60, uh, is resulting in a labor shortage in two areas, unskilled, undesirable jobs at the bottom end of the <coughs> economic ladder, and high-skilled jobs at the top. For example, uh, in Germany, 39% of German engineers and scientists are scheduled to retire in the next 10 years. So, replacing them is, is part of an immigration policy. But an immigration policy is an attempt to regulate the movement of people across national borders, with each country trying to maximize the social and economic benefits of immigration while limiting its negative social effects, potential negative social effects, that is, the costs and conflicts arising from cultural differences and attempts at integration of the foreign-born populations into the host society. While the direct immigration of workers for particular types of employment is the first consideration of many policies, there are also many who immigrate to escape persecution under the asylum provisions of the Geneva Convention, people who are taken in without regard to their employment potential. Both economic and political immigrants will wish to bring other family members to accompany them, thus an immigration policy must also take into account the reunification of families. In France, this is the largest category of legal immigrants. Immigration policy has generally been the purview of national governments, but local ordinances can significantly influence immigration. So here in the United States, in the 19th century, state governments made their own rules requiring shipping companies to post bonds, ensuring that immigrants would not become wards of the state. And they also required shipping companies to provide a certain amount of space for each passenger to help prevent the spread of disease in the steerage compartment. Local governments can also be influential in making the lives of immigrants unpleasant, a process described in a New York Times article last year as deportation by attrition. Limits on the provision of basic services, including education and medical care, are example of local laws that can influence immigration. Just this morning, the New York Times reported on the harassment of immigrants by a sheriff in North Carolina where local officials have taken on some of the authority of the federal government. Earlier this summer, the Times ran an article about how a hospital in Florida forcibly returned a patient to Nicaragua by air ambulance to avoid having to continue to provide him with services. And this is not an isolated in incident. Uh, last year, a hospital in Phoenix repatriated 96 patients, and all of this without any uh, government requirement or intervention. Generally speaking, though, there are international policies like the Geneva Convention of 1951 that I mentioned uh, concerning refugees and asylum seekers, and there are national policies. So in a couple of minutes, I'll look at uh, somewhat more detail about how the European Union has been struggling to find a common immigration policy for its 27 countries. Uh, but first, I want to take a quick peek at national laws. The United States has frequently used national laws on naturalization and citizenship to regulate the flow of immigration, requiring longer residence for naturalization and citizenship to regulate the flow of immigration. Uh, longer, longer residence uh, dissuades people from coming. Shorter periods have been instituted when there was more impetus to increase immigration. Another technique to ensure that only the right people come to our shores has been pure xenophobia, the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, or the quota systems of the 1921-1924 laws that essentially ended legal immigration from Eastern and Southern Europe for the following 40 years. In recent years, uh, just to keep up that sort of xenophobic uh, trend, a number of books have decried the Hispanicization of America taking aim at the new immigrants, Catholicism, as well as their language and other social uh, practices. So you have Samuel Huntington's 
who are we that challenge us to national identity. Um, and uh, about 10 years earlier, Arthur Schlesinger writing The Disuniting of America. So similar questions have been raised in Europe with the concern primarily over uh, Muslim women wearing the veil in France. And uh, for instance, the murder of Dutch filmmaker Theo van Hoek. Within the European Union, the goal has been integration, that is the removal of all barriers for trade including the free movement of peoples within the 27 member states. Started as a common market of six countries, Belgium, France, Germany, Italy, Luxembourg, and the Netherlands, the EU is now a much more ambitious attempt to arrive at common policies in a wide variety of social issues and political concerns, as well as the ever-broadening economic cooperation, including the single currency. Uh, one unique feature of the European Union is that all these pro uh, policies are subject to the opt-out provisions that permit countries not to participate in the common structure of the EU for a specific area. Immigration cuts across all of those uh, areas of social and political concerns and economic concerns. So now I'll take you on a brief journey through the last 20 years of EU policy on the free movement of peoples. First, a uh, basic uh, lesson on the administrative structure of the EU. The EU has two uh, legislative uh, bodies, the Council, which is composed of ministers from each country, which has the greatest legislative power, the Parliament, which is directly elected uh, by the people of the member states, and then an executive branch uh, composed of the European Commission in uh, Brussels. So uh, that helps explain a little bit the handout that I've given you, what the sources for all these different uh, proposals. The most remarkable achievement in a common immigration policy is the Schengen Agreement, or maybe I should say the Schengen Agreements, uh, which have essentially eliminated border crossings within the territory of the European Union, from the Atlantic to the border of the former Soviet Socialist Republics, from above the Arctic Circle to the shores of the Mediterranean. The first agreement was reached in 1985, with subsequent expansions in 1990 and most recently in 2005. England and Ireland opted out of Schengen, but Switzerland, Norway, and Liechtenstein, which are not EU countries, have opted in. The elimination of border controls within the vast territory of Europe has put that much more pressure on the external borders, requiring the establishment in 2004 of Frontex, which is stands short for uh, the official title for it is the European Agency for the Management of Operational Cooperation at the External Borders of the Member States of the European Union. So you can see why we prefer Frontex. Yeah. It's headquartered in Warsaw, perhaps in recognition of the concern that the borders between the newly admitted Eastern European states and their neighbors to the east might be the most porous, and therefore in the greatest need for coordination and training. After Schengen, the next major steps were the treaties of Maastricht in 1992 and of Amsterdam concluded in 1997 and entering into force in 1999. These established the goal of a common foreign and security policy among the, 50, the then 15 member states, as I say, now there are 27, <coughs> including a common immigration policy. So Article 63.3 of uh, the Treaty of Amsterdam asked the Council to adopt measures on immigration policy within the following areas, conditions of entry and residence, and standards on procedures for the issue by member states of long-term visas and residence permits. The elaboration of a common immigration policy took shape after a European Council meeting held in Tampere, Finland in October of 1999. The principles agreed upon in Tampere required that the common immigration policy include a balance between economic and humanitarian admission, fair treatment of third country nationals comparable to the privileges of citizens of the EU countries, and engagement with the countries of origin to improve their situation and discourage immigration. The following year, a communication from the European Commission, that is the executive branch, um, asked that any common immigration policy take into account the economic and demographic development of the European Union, each state's ability to absorb non-EU immigrants, 
the historical and cultural links between each individual state and non-EU countries, such as the former colonies, the impact of the brain drain on countries of origin, and finally, the integration of third country nationals into the societies that uh, receive them. In 2001, the Commission issued a proposal for a directive that enumerated the conditions for admission of third country nationals and the conditions under which they could remain. This proposal outlined the aims and principles of a common policy on economic migration. These included transparency and clarity of the conditions under which an economic migrant would be admitted, the differentiation of rights according to length of stay, distinguishing between temporary workers and permanent immigrants, respect for the domestic labor market, uh, that is, ensuring that posts were filled uh, by a third country national only after a thorough assessment of the domestic labor market situation. And finally, assistance for European industry in the recruitment of third country nationals. However, no agreement on the, implication, on the implementation of these principles was ever reached, and the proposal expired in 2006. The Council has been more successful in other endeavors. In 2002, a common fund was established along with common procedures for the repatriation of undocumented immigrants. In 2003, the Council agreed on the principle of family reunification. And in 2004, on the establishment of Aeneas, which is a financial and technical assistance program for the countries of origin in the hopes of stemming the flow of immigrants to the EU. Uh, those, that last uh, policy has not been terribly successful due to continuing economic disparity, but efforts are continuing as evidenced by 2006 EU-Africa Ministerial Conference on Migration and Development. For legal immigrants, the EU has established the European Fund for Integration, which assists national governments in enabling third country nationals of different economic, social, cultural, religious, linguistic, and ethnic backgrounds to fulfill the conditions of residence and to facilitate their integration into European societies. So for example, Germany now has an extensive integration course as part of a new immigration law that came into force in January of 2005. The course includes 630 classroom hours of language instruction and familiarization with German culture, history, political values, the legal system, and political institutions. Other countries have or are launching similar programs with the aid of the European Fund for, for Immigration. This is just a very brief overview of the types of policy decisions that countries and international organizations are making, attempting to balance economic and humanitarian considerations. Now, uh, Dorote and Alejandro will look at some more specific cases so we can see the effect of policy in a more concrete manner. Dorote. Thank you. Dorote Schneider. Lots of things happening today, so um, I think this is uh, very special that you made the choice to come to our panel. After uh, Professor Kibbe's grand tour of European immigration policy and law, uh, I would like to take a turn across the Atlantic and back in time for a few minutes. But I will refrain from the grand tour mode and invite you to uh, revisit some of the general points of American immigration policy during the question and answer period. I will limit myself to a few observations on an underappreciated phenomenon, the increasing proportion of US immigrants who are women. For much of the 20th century, the United States Immigration and Naturalization Service counted more women than men legally admitted to the United States. Since 1960, the majority of the foreign born in the United States has also been female. I think you will agree with me that this important fact is bound to influence how we look at immigrants today, and it should guide our understanding of immigration policy past and present as well. Could it be that the preponderance of females is even an intended result of US immigration policy? Or do women immigrate to the United States in larger numbers than men, despite the intentions of the law? 
During the first decades of the 20th century, US immigration and naturalization policy, loose as it was, had an obvious and intended gender bias. Until the 1921 Emergency Quota Act, all were admissible upon arrival in the United States unless they fell under one of many excludable categories. Only a few of these categories were explicitly gendered. Prostitutes were excludable, for example. And many practices and policies made women more likely to be turned back than men. For example, pregnant women who were single or could not prove marriage to a breadwinner were usually sent back. Women were also more likely to be sent back or ought to go back if a family member they traveled with was judged excludable, for example, a child with an illness or an elderly relative. That person would be sent back, but the uh, woman in the family group was usually opt to go back with that person, and the men or the man would proceed. In general, women were judged to be uh, to likely to be economically dependent, which made them more, quote unquote, likely to become a public charge. That is, an official formulation and a major category of exclusion. Immigration policy wanted to promote both morally upright and economically independent workers. For men, this meant that skilled and physically strong workers were preferred. Women needed to show that they came with or would join close family and that they could work in a quasi-domestic environment. Single working class women without obvious family and likely confined to low wage jobs had more difficulties passing muster under these standards. Domesticity, potential or real, was an important criterion in admitting women immigrants, though no law explicitly articulated this. Immigrant women knew about the ideas or ideals which shaped immigration admission. They traveled with male family members, if at all possible, or formed quasi-families for the trip in order to smooth admission. For example, groups of women traveled with males whom they knew but weren't relatives um, from the same village, um, for example, and then they pretended to be um, in a family. Some women, experienced factory workers or craftswomen tried to make themselves into domestics, that is, into domestic servants, in order to pass through Ellis Island successfully. Many succeeded. It is a, a woman with, let's say, a skill as a hat maker would pretend that she was entering as a uh, household servant rather than as a hat maker because um, she felt that this was um, the road to admission. And I found cases where this succeeded. But sometimes immigration inspectors during this so-called open door immigration era were mistrustful and subjected to the lives of women immigrants to close scrutiny at times months after their arrival. These women were admitted on probation and then inspectors would um, look them up, literally, at their new addresses and see if they were in fact doing what they said they would be doing. Uh, they would be servants. Inspectors traveled to the hinterlands to check on what had become, especially young women who claimed to be domestics, for example, or they called women back to see if they were still with their employer as household servants. In my research, I have found that immigrant women defended themselves vigorously and successfully against the implied accusation that they were morally dubious characters with few domestic talents. The quota laws of the 1920s changed the landscape of gendered admission in a number of ways, mostly by making marriage a more valuable tool for preferred admission, especially for women, not necessarily for men. The 1924 Nationality Quota Law allowed wives of US citizens admission outside the quota. Marriage to an American still gets you in faster than almost anything else today. And the 1924 law gave prefer a preferential spot to wives of permanent resident aliens. This is, to a lesser extent, also still true. The possibilities for women to enter on their own, however, were very limited from the 1920s <coughs> on. 
US consuls who gave out immigration visas were wary of the ability of women to be self-sufficient economically. Interestingly, women who did gain admission tended to be, again, the low-paying, though traditional, and domestic jobs. They um, said they would be household servants, nannies, or nurses, for example. But by the 1930s, even maids were no longer wanted, and few unattached women could gain legal entry into the United States at all. Fast forward to recent decades. Today, since the 1965 immigration law, to be exact, immigration law sorts by occupational preference and family relationship to give prospective immigrants a shot at a green card. This system appears to be gender neutral, but on closer inspection, the different categories tend to give heavy preference to either men as professionals or women as quote-unquote close family members. Initial admissions of people with certain professional qualifications tend to favor men. In their home countries, men tend to have better access to the higher education that produces desirable professionals. Again, reproducing patriarchal family structures, men then become the pioneer migrants and breadwinners for their families who will then sponsor the rest of the family. Wives, young children, and sometimes a mother-in-law will join them. Without actually stating this up front, the current system thus mirrors patriarchal family systems abroad and helps continue this not entirely un-American pattern as well in this country. But there is another component to recent gender immigration, one that favors women. Of the preferred occupations whose members can hope for preferential admission, a significant percentage are in the healthcare field, a heavily female occupational character, uh, category in the United States. This is a large group of workers where doctors are not the majority. It encompasses personal attendants, especially in geriatric care, physical therapists, and most of all, nurses. But wait a minute, you'll say. Surely, the law does not give preference to both immigrant skilled nurses, anesthesiologists, and immigrant nursing home attendants and nannies who earn just a bit above the minimum wage. I would argue that if we want to understand how women immigrants enter the United States and how they succeed in making their claim for admission, we need to see this group in its entirety, both low-skilled and high-skilled together. Obviously, well-educated nurses, pediatricians, and certified physical therapists will gain admission because of their formal credentials and the certified need for their services in the American labor market, just like men. But those with few, if any, formal credentials in caregiving or healthcare are also, also have a shot, and here women have an advantage. Most in the latter group, in this uh, unskilled, so-called unskilled group, actually gain admission after having lived in this country for a while, usually as undocumented workers. Let me illustrate this with the life story of a woman I befriended two decades ago. Asanai Dawai is an immigrant from a Pacific Island nation, which she always refers to unselfconsciously as the old country. Asanai had left home, that is an extended family and the young daughter, after a failed marriage in the early 1980s. She had to find work away from the depressed economy of her home country, where custom and a lack of well-paying jobs conspired to keep her social status low and economic opportunities at a minimum. For a while, she worked in a nursing home in Sydney. But after an immigration raid there, she was deported from Australia. A couple of years later, she again left her home in search of work, landing at LAX around 1985. The INS detained her, suspicious of her intentions, although she had a tourist visa. After a few days' detention at an airport motel, she's literally detained there with guards and so on, um, she was uh, released and joined relatives in the LA area, eventually finding work as a nanny in San Diego and then in LA County. In 1987, her employers decided to sponsor her for a green card. Even back then, getting a green card was not an easy task for a woman with, as it turned out, an eighth grade education, 
no formal qualifications for her job as a nanny, and no close relatives in the United States. On the other hand, no one wanted her deported, and she was able to remain with the same employer. Throughout the long years of waiting for visa approval, she lived a daily life in which she was both visible in a mostly white suburb where she worked and lived, and invisible. She looked like an African American to Californians. For male immigrants of her background, this feat would have been almost impossible to achieve. It was crucial to gain admission in the end to prove that she was both there and not there in many, on many levels. In 1995, Vasanai received her green card. By then, she had accumulated considerable savings in the United States. She had financed her daughter's high school education back home, sent money to the family, and generally risen in social status there, although she had not actually been able to visit for about a decade. Today, she remains in Southern California, an honored older woman in her family who not only owns a condo fully paid, Dad, in Los Angeles, but also financed the extension of the family homestead back in the old country and the education of at least one grandchild. Stories like hers are not all that rare, but they are largely unheard amid the many more life stories of immigrant women for whom immigration spells uncertainty, poverty, displacement, and often deportation. What I think is worth pointing out though, are the parallels in the life trajectory between the two groups of women early and late in the century, who persisted in carving out their permanent place in this country in face of immigration laws, which made and make it difficult or impossible for working class women to be admitted on their own. When all is said and done, both generations of working women ultimately base their claim to admission on their demonstrable domesticity. While immigration law especially today, is somewhat opaque on this point, admission practice clearly reflects a bias in favor of women in caring professions, be it as mothers, paid caregivers, or formally certified healthcare professionals. For early 20th century women, immigrants qualifying on the strength of their domestic virtues meant a life of moral rectitude lived under the watchful eyes of fellow workers, employers, or neighbors. For Vasana and thousands of her fellow immigrants, things are not all that different. Without an education or family close by, their claim to admission is best made on the strength of their skills as household and care workers, characteristics closely connected to domesticity. Moral and gendered assumptions about worth, which have little to do with technical and formal qualifications, continue to shape our ideas about immigrants in general, but especially about immigrant women in the 21st century. We would do better as a nation if we examined the power of these assumptions and their effects on shaping current and future immigration policies critically and with honesty. Thank you. Thank you. Now we'll have Alejandra Lugo. First, I would like to uh, thank you for being, you know, for being here this afternoon, you know. and uh, that's important. I, uh, I'm approaching this uh, a presentation in perhaps in a, a different way, uh, in tro analytically. Uh, I, in, I feel that immigration policy is much more than just about uh, regulations, although we need to include regulations. It's much more than just about legislation. It's about ideas. I am an ethnographer, and I think about, okay, what, in, what influences immigration policy, uh, culturally speaking, and the, the level of, of everyday life? And um, if Dorothy uh, discussed the question of gender, I would like you to think about my presentation in terms of issues of uh, racism, uh, racism in, uh, in immigration policy. And I am very concerned about our situation right now. I am Mexican, Mexican-American. A comprehensive, uh, comprehensive, comprehensive <coughs> immigration policy is still you know, hanging there. 
And uh, I do feel that uh, at this historical moment, uh, there are some issues that have uh, occurred, especially in relation to Latinos, but particularly Mexicans, that I don't think we as a society have addressed. And um, so I'm gonna look at a, at a particular uh, legislation which did not become law, HR 4437, but that nonetheless had a huge impact and continues to have an impact, I believe, on actual policy whether at the level of city ordinance or at the level of federal um, implementation uh, of deportation um, uh, law. So, uh, okay, so please uh, bear with me. I will get to the question of Mexico at the end because I do think that this issue concerns Mexicans in the U.S., but we cannot separate Mexico from Mexicans in the U.S. So I will get to that uh, issue uh, that is, I think, comparative, but uh, in the spirit, of thinking about uh, what issues might, like the ones that I'm gonna address to, today, and I'll read pretty fast, okay, uh, and hopefully clearly for you. But I'm thinking about what issues that I address here actually are to be found in the EU, uh, for example, uh, regarding uh, anti-immigrant groups, let's say, who are very active, and their impact on, again, immigration policy. So that is uh, what I'm trying to do here. Um, now, to begin with, uh, now I, getting the nation story straight, okay, there's this, uh, there was this editorial in the New York Times, now I, like probably you guys, I do read the New York Times, I'm far away from my family, so that's one of the ways in which I spend my time, but I'm also doing a study of how the New York Times deals with immigration uh, in its many forms including obituaries and how the, the life stories of people are you know, uh, discussed in terms of immigration policy and immigration um, experiences. But uh, in a much needed editorial in the New York Times, Francis Kleins made the following observation about the Ellis Island Immigration Museum. Quote, the true tale of America involves far more than teeming masses yearning to be free. What about the ignored immigrant sagas of slaves brought in chains from Africa? Native Americans who arrived in prehistory and were forced to emigrate out of the path of settlers, and Mexicans and Hawaiians pressing to citizenship through war and annexation, not to mention the horse of illegal immigrants still arriving with no fanfare. It's time to tell the story in all its fullness, says Alan Kraut, chairman of the Museum's History Committee, which has been given the formidable task of setting the record straight in a 20 million expansion called the Peopling of America Center. The plan is to free Ellis Island from its own immigration intake chronology, 1892-1954, and present the nation's fuller story across centuries, coast to coast. Uh, now, Klein, uh, Klein's closes her note with the following. This logically must include illegal immigrants, say, says Mr. Crabb, who proudly concedes he may have had a grandfather who sneaked into the country. The point is to tell the real story. We'll, we'll be doing good things, he says, hopefully breaking through the current wave of nativism and the anti-immigrant nonsense, Grat says. Now, before I continue, I also would like to uh, uh, get to help you get the nation's historical geography straight, you know, just in case you don't think about this enough. But we, this is, these are maps from our own library, and it shows uh, the U.S. and Mexico in the mid-19th uh, century, okay? And uh, the U.S., the, the one that we love today, is so big and so, you know, incredible in part because of the Mexican War of 1846 to 1848. Um, so this geographical uh, input is absent from many museums on immigration. This moment in 1846-1848 did not explain at all. So um, you'll see why I bring this up. Now, but before I move on, <clears throat> I have to correct both clients and crowd, getting the nation's name straight. In noting that for people in Latin America and the Caribbean, the USA is not America. Guillermo Gomez Peña wrote, let's get it straight. America is a continent, not a country. Latin America encompasses more than half of America. Quechuas, Mixtecos, and Iroquois are American, not U.S. citizens. Chicano, New Yorican, Afro-Caribbean, and Quebecois cultures are American as well. 
Mexicans and Canadians are also North American. Newly arrived Vietnamese and Laotians will soon become Americans. U.S. Anglo-European culture is but a mere component of a much larger cultural complex in constant metamorphosis. Now I bring this up because in the New York Times editorial, the, the museum is gonna be called People of America, and they mean the U.S. So, so in this context, who is more of an outsider slash immigrant? The Mexican from Southern Mexico who migrates to Arizona, what used to be Northern Mexico, or the white American who moved to Arizona 50 years after the Mexican War, after arriving at Ellis Island from Europe. In fact, in the last two years, the sheriff of Maricopa County in the Phoenix area, Joe Arpaio, and his police officers have been terrorizing the Mexican community through racial profiling by raiding workplaces, for instance. Last week, City Hall in a library where Latino janitors work, you know, he went there in search of undocumented workers who used forged identification to gain employment. He has been targeting not only undocumented, but anyone who looks like one, citizen or not. So, you know, in this narrative of getting things straight, um, it, again, this is just a rhetorical, you know, phrase. Uh, what about the population figures for the, uh, for the undocumented population? He said 12 million, 11 million, or 20 million, as some people say. In 2002, Dana Gabasha, a historian of immigration, wrote the following, and she has been here, about IRCA and the 1980s undocumented population. Quote, in 1985, the U.S. Census had to put to rest wild, wild charges that 12 million illegals live in the USA, and that the country had lost control of its borders. Even when the Census Bureau instead estimated a smaller group of 3 million foreigners lacking proper documents, Congress took action under pressure from disturbed citizens. Right, this sounds familiar. The 1986, 1986 Immigration Reform and Control Act granted, this is, this is Gabasha, still, uh, amnesty, granted amnesty to a large number of illegals, she says illegals, allowing them to become immigrants and to obtain the green cards necessary to live legally in the USA. More than two million became immigrants. But the discourse in 1986 was still about 12 million. Okay, and we have to question again this, uh, these actually accusations about the invasion of, 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 uh, of, of the U.S. So today, or for that matter, since 2002, then what is the estimated figure for undocumented workers? Have you heard it, right? 12 million, again? Let us see. According to the Pew Hispanic Center, as of March 2005, there were 5.4 million adult males, 3.9 million adult females, and 1.8 million children, totaling 11.1 million unauthorized immigrants. Among these families, there are additionally 3.1 million children who are American citizens by birth. Thus, among the so-called invasion of illegal aliens, we find 4.9 million children, two-thirds of them U.S. citizens. If we were to focus on adults only, we identified 9.1 million unauthorized immigrants. Of these, 7.2 million were employed as of March 2005. 7.2 million. The Pew Hispanic Center knows that these 7.2 million workers account for only 4.9% of the whole American labor force, which itself total, totals, this is the, that year, 148 million workers. So are these 7.2 million illegal aliens really taking over our major industries? The economic sectors where they work consist of farming, fishing, and forestry, 24%, cleaning, 17%, construction, 14%, food preparation, 12%. Again, which means that construction, 14%, that means that, what, 86% are actually U.S. citizens. But if you just look then, uh, so, but this is, this is, of course, before the mess in Wall Street, right? And before the housing uh, problem that we have. But perhaps we should ask ourselves, are these 7.2 million workers who are ultimately from all over the world without denying that the majority are Latinos? Are they truly damaging the, our economy? Or are they contributing to our American way of life? Now, then let me uh, get into uh, HR 4437 and the Sensenbrenner era. Not the Jim Crow era, but the Jim Sensenbrenner era. 
for many Latinos, for Mexicanos, what's happening today is really, really powerful. Jim Sensen Brenner, the Republican congressman from Wisconsin, was the co author of HR 4437, titled Border Protection, Anti Terrorism, and Illegal Immigration Control Act of 2005. In the title, he's lumping together, they lump together, King and him, uh, immigration with terrorism to begin with. Okay. A New York Times article titled People at the House Latches onto Immigration, July 11, 2006. That article begins by stating, Representative James Sensor Brenner has no tolerance for illegal immigrants, either in his political life or personal life. My housekeeper, he says, in Wisconsin, was born in Wisconsin, the Republican congressman says. My housekeeper here is a naturalized US citizen from Nicaragua. Now, the article continues, highlighting, it seems to me, Mr. Sensor Brenner's anti-Mexicanism. He is the policymaker in charge of writing these policies. He says, this is the, the article continues, Mr. Sensenbrenner Brenner is so loath to risk dealing with illegal immigrants that when his Cadillacs need cleaning, he prefers do-it-yourself car washes that require tokens. They don't have Montezuma's picture on the front of them, Mr. Sensenbrenner Brenner says of the tokens. And this is the beginning of a front page article in the New York Times. Now, Sensen Brenner's uh, 4437 proposed that a fence or wall should be built right on the US-Mexico border. Recent, according to that document, one million illegals cross the US-Mexico border every year. One million every year, that's seven. The Pew Hispanic Center in the 1992 to 2004 study, however, presents the following figures for both legal and illegal entrants to the US from the west, east, and north, not just through the southern US-Mexico border. Quote, from the early 1990s through the middle of the decade, slightly more than 1. 1. million migrants came to the United States every year on average. In the peak years of 1999 and 2000, the inflow was about 35% higher, topping 1.5 million. By 2002 and 2003, the number coming to the country was back around the 1.1 million mark. Now, this is 2002 and 2003. When did Francis Brenner write that legislation? 2005. Now, this basic pattern of increased peak and decline, the, you know, the center, right, right, is evident for the foreign born from every region of the world and or both legal and uh, unauthorized migrants. Now, given these figures of the yearly 1.1 million legal and illegal entrants from all over the world, why would HR 4437 state in Title X, Section 1001, that, quote, the number of illegal entrants into the United States through the southwest border is estimated to exceed one million a year. Yet, even though HR 4437 did not become law, on September of 2006, the Senate did pass a bill to build a wall, as you know, at our southern border. Quote, the Senate on Friday approved the building of 700 miles of fence along the nation's southwestern border fulfilling a demand by conservative Republicans to take steps to slow the flow of illegal immigrants before exploring broader changes to immigration law. Now, through this legislation and the focus on the, on, on the southern border, you can see, I, I hope you can see, uh, the uh, racism against Mexicans in Mexico uh, there. This vote took place a few months after the spring marches, which constituted an unprecedented number in the millions of Latinos peacefully protesting across the country in both major and minor cities. The focus of the marches was to protest, among other things, the criminalization not only of undocumented immigrants, but of all Latinos. After all, in the eyes of ICE officials, we're all potential immigrants and therefore potential criminals or illegals. One year later, in June 28, 2007, the Comprehensive Immigration Reform Act of 2007 mm -hmm. fell through. Why did it fail? Multiple reasons among them, right? But one of them is that there were threats to some senators who were pro-bill, including Republican Mel Melendez. An article published in 2007, uh, immigration bill prompts some menacing responses. But there was also pressure from small but very loud and influential anti-immigration groups such as Numbers USA, Numbers USA. A million faxes later, a little known group claims a victory on immigration. 
Today and almost every day, Numbers USA publishes anti-immigrant ads. On the day after the Senate bill was defeated, Senator David Peter, the Louisiana Republican who helped lead the opposition, said, the proponents did not get even a simple majority. The message is crystal clear. The American people want us to start with enforcement at the border and at the workplace, and don't want promises. They want action. They want results. Now, enforcement at, enforcement at the border and the workplaces is what HR 4437 was, was all about to begin with. Well, 4437 focused on criminalizing undocumented workers and those who helped them. Two previous immigration policies did the following. IRCA criminalized the hiring of undoc undocumented workers and the Illegal Immigration Reform and Immigration Responsibility Act of 1996 imposed new costs and penalties against migrants repeatedly apprehended for unauthorized entry. Now, throughout the late, late 80s and all throughout the 90s, the border was militarized in ways not seen before, at least since the late 1950s when Operation Wetback was executed. In the last 18 months or so, the undocumented and their legal and or Amer American children are being legally raided by ICE officials in their homes and in the workplaces, particularly in the food processing industries across the country, especially chicken, beef, pork, and kosher plants, where thousands of unauthorized workers labor. ICE officials are targeting Hispanics, not only Mexicans, but also Guatemalans, Salvadorans, and Hondurans, etc. Anyone who looks Mexican with excuse that these individuals committed identity fraud. The federal government is using right now, right now, a 2004 law that imposes a mandatory two-year sentence for people who commit this crime of identity theft. The Supreme Court is gonna take to this particular uh, case actually is uh, it's going to the Supreme Court and the, uh, the issue is whether the people who are being targeted as criminals for identity, identity theft knowingly without lawful authority you know use the identification of another person. So this is one way in which the undocumented as HR 4437 provision is being criminalized. Also in June 2008 the New York Times article noted that criminal prosecutions of immigrants by federal authorities surged to a record high in March as immigration cases accounted for the majority, 57%. Now, by the way, this is right now, this month, with a need to investigate white collar crime associated with financial fraud in the recent Wall Street mess, the FBI has acknowledged that they do not have enough agents. Why? Because they're, you know, most of the agents are actually working on immigration cases. Uh, but what about the Mexican government and its immigration policy, you might think? For the Mexican government, immigration policy includes policy on Mexicans' emigration to other countries, especially the U.S., with the increase of Mexican immigrants, legal and illegal, throughout the United States, and with awareness of this administration's criminalization of the paisanos. The Mexican government has increased its Mexican consulates throughout the USA. As of May 2007, Mexico had 47 Mexican consulates in 21 states in the District of Columbia. There are actually 539 foreign consulates in the United States, and Mexico has more than any other country. After Mexico, Canada has 19, Japan 17, and Britain 12, according to the New York Times article. Now, Mexico's geographical proximity to the US and the Mexicans' remittances to Mexico explain both politically and economically the presence of so many consulates. I'm almost, I'm almost done, okay? Mexico's immigration policy on foreigners as immigrants in Mexico. What about that? If a foreigner does not enter the country legally, of course, he or she will be deported, according to La Ley General de Población, well, accounting for corruption. In practice, and throughout the 1990s and into the present, Mexican immigration officials have caught and deported thousands of Central Americans, especially of Hondurans, Guatemalans, and Salvadorans, as well as South Americans, particularly Brazilians. During the first months of the Vicente Fox presidency, Mexico claimed to deport other Latin Americans in solidarity with the U.S., meaning catching them before entering the U.S. illegally. This week, Mexico, this week, Mexico's current president, Felipe Calderón, made a deal with the Cuban government to catch and deport to Cuba any legal Cubans caught in Mexico, again, before these Cubans reached the U.S.-Mexico border. The Mexican government's treatment of undocumented immigrants in Mexico has been criticized by human rights officials Many anti-immigrant groups in the U.S., of course, have also called Mexico's immigration law hypocritical, to say the least. So one of the main questions regarding immigration law, not only in Mexico and the U.S., but elsewhere as well, is how to make immigration policy humane 
towards those in economic and political need of immigrating from their country of origin. Uh, then the last phrase, uh, Robert Corney Smith, who did a study of transnational life in Mexico and New York, proposes that instead of just an immigration policy, which determines only who gets in, the United States or ex nation needs an immigration policy that helps newcomers to become citizens, learn the language, participate fully in the country's institutions, and help their children to do the same. Such a policy would help those environments themselves, he says. This is, I believe, at least a good beginning, but I think the conversation would bring more uh, aspects to the solution. Thank you. Okay, we want to take a few minutes now, hopefully, to have some uh, discussion with you and answer questions. Well, everybody has a lot to say, um, and I'm certain that many of you in the audience have had a lot of experience with this topic, too, that's uh, being ignored in much of the campaign in the U.S. right now uh, because of its sensitivity. And uh, this is a chance. So why don't we take a few questions? They are recording, so I'd appreciate it if you'd come up and talk into the microphone. Why don't we take, like, three questions, if there are questions, and then let the panel address them. Don't be shy. It's just us. <laughs> and get closer if you want. I have a question. Um, you were talking about opting, the European Union opting out, some of the countries opting out. Well, if the United States had some kind of federal policy, would the different states have the options of opting out too? And then what would be the purpose of having it if they're opting out? Yeah, I don't, I don't think can, U.S. law allows we, you to opt out. That's correct. A part of the can we take just a... But the, but the European... Oh, one, but oh, the European can we just see if we have a few questions? And then, uh, okay. since we don't have too much time, I thought if we could see if they group or not, or if oh, there are other questions, we'll answer. We'll address about three of them together, if there are additional questions, or especially if there's similar grouping of questions. But uh, anything that you have that's worked out well in the past. But if we don't, have, all right, go ahead. Well, first, sorry for my English. It's only my second month here. Okay. <laughs> I'm from Spain, which is part of the European Union. And talking about policies, uh, last week was approved the European Pact on Immigration and Asylum, which is considered the first really policy on immigration in Europe, because those you have talked about are uh, concrete, uh, concrete, uh, things, but not a policy. A policy is more than, more than laws, more than making laws, more than controlled borders. So this is the first one. I have it here. Okay. And uh, can you repeat the name of it, the, the, the name of, of the... Of yes. The if you give us the URL later, we can put it on the web page that's linked to the Center for Advanced Yes, Study. it's European Pact on Immigration and Asylum. Okay. You can download it from the Council of the European Union. Okay. It's a, a week ago. Okay. I just want to say that. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, did you have a question? Did, did you have a question? Or did well, you have a... I was interested in the discussion of um, gender and immigration. I guess I hadn't thought about it too much, but I wondered if you thought the next chapter of, of your study would be sort of a, a reverse of where it's been. I'm not a scholar or a researcher. I'm a practitioner. I'm an attorney. And my cases have been the opposite. They've been men who you know, their wives have gotten naturalization and they, the men aren't getting it. And I'm Muslim, a lot of the clients that I have are Muslim also. And I'm definitely seeing that trend just from my own practice. I haven't read too much on the statistics changing or where that's headed, but, you know, I've got clients who'll go to a naturalization interview and they'll say the wife is approved and the husband's not. And I'm seeing that more and more just in my own practice. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Well, let's address these three questions. Opting out, well, the one, the second one wasn't really a regular question, but it gave us good information. And the um, third one on gender and immigration and the reverse uh, discrimination for Muslims. Would, uh, what, you want to start with, or either Adulta, of you? you want to say something about opting out? Or, um, I just uh, could say that under U.S. law, immigration law is a federal responsibility. Um, there's no doubt about that, although, uh, with these uh, recent activist sheriffs, for example, and local police department acting as the 
quasi-agents of um, immigration enforcement. Uh, this is, um, is, I think, is definitely going to go to the Supreme Court because um, this is a uh, problematic intrusion and uh, we'll have to see, um, and I think we'll have to await a different uh, uh, executive um, post-election um, where, uh, where the federal um, uh, role can be reasserted over state and local communities. Um, as to gender, I'm not surprised at what you tell me about an non-admission of men. Um, this is uh, a sort of, actually I see that in support of my argument. Men cannot claim domesticity as a way of qualifying themselves as good husbands. Um, so they, ha they um, are however suspicious under many other, uh, in many other ways as political activists, for example, possibly. Um, the, the pro these problems are not new. They occurred already in the late 1920s and during the 1930s when U.S. citizen wives had problems sponsoring their husbands and husbands didn't get in. Um, I think the reasons were different, but um, from, from what you um, hint, we don't know, of course, you turn down, you're never given a reason, right? Um, but it, uh, it reinforces my idea that gender plays an enormous role. Some of it is, you know, underwater, the iceberg underwater, we don't really know. So to, to pick up a little bit more on the opting out, uh, the European Union is a very complex uh, political arrangement of um, 27 member states, and uh, They've been sometimes opting out as a matter of when the state joined the, the EU. And, uh, the, uh, but just for some examples, uh, the, the open borders part that I mentioned, Ireland, the UK, and uh, originally Denmark, although uh, Denmark's now changed its mind, uh, all opted out of having open borders, so they still required uh, same kind of border checks of every EU citizen coming into their their countries. The eurozone is another example. You know, the countries have to um, can decide whether they want to pursue having the euro as their currency. And a number of countries don't. A number of countries don't qualify because of their economic situation. But those that do uh, uh, can opt out if they don't if they want to keep the the Swati in, so in Poland. So they can choose whatever they want to. Well, I think the um, often, even when they opt out, they they end up doing what everybody else is doing, more or less. Uh, I think that the purpose for the um, uh, not opting out of, uh, or I'm, I'm sorry, of opting out for the UK and Ireland in, in the immigration uh, restrictions uh, was a fear, uh, probably mostly a xenophobic fear of uh, the hordes of people who are going to rush into the UK uh, from so they're other countries. Basically, they're doing it for economic reasons. Right. Well, economic I'm and social I mean, social the issues. The EU coming together is for economic. The EU coming together is is uh, it, originally it was the iron and steel uh, or coal and coal and iron. I can't. I've forgotten the. Uh, but it was a, it, it's. Um, it was originally formed purely as an economic thing. And so spreading out into these social issues is, uh, is relatively new and controversial. Uh, in some countries, I think it's one of the problems that the various attempts at having the EU constitution in the last uh, 10 years or so have run up uh, to that difficulty that people felt they were giving up too much. You know, I want to comment too when you were talking about the different states can't opt out. Well, one of the things, I used to live in San Diego, and one of the things is I understand that it's going to be a federal law when they do pass something, but states like California and Arizona take care of a lot of the health care for these people since they're so close to the border. So how is that going to be addressed? Health care and schools are not right. federal. So I'm saying, though, they, can, they have options to opt out of some things then. Um, no. And how, the, how is the federal government Let, going to address the funding? That's well, what I'm wondering. That's, well, that's I, not 
limited to immigration. I think that you've raised a very important point of this division between local and federal funding for the changes and transitions required. And uh, Alejandro also mentioned in his talk that local ordinances do have some impact on national policies. Uh, but uh, I don't think we're going to resolve this, but uh, we at least begin to look at it. And we have a couple of more questions, so I'd like to get them on board. Okay. You know, before you ask the question, I just wanted to make sure that we address your. You, do you want us? Do you want us to comment, or were you just giving us the information? No, I want to say something. And when, when in Europe, when we speak about policy, we are speaking. We are from this document because we want to start with the document. There were only regulations about border control because, of course, we are now 27 countries. An immigrant gets into the union, for example, in Spain. So, are you asking a question or just making yes. the point? I'm okay. making some sort of one observation. In this document, it's the first time that in the European Union, well, I will not read you some sentences. Illegal immigrants on member states' territory must leave that territory. And in the second term, it says to use to that elder and consular agrees to use only case by case regularization rather than generalized, generalized regularization. For example, in the year 2005, Spain did a special legalization process that was highly criticized of, of the Union. So this now is the first time that the Union says, OK, from now to the future, it, there, there is going to be an European policy. So the question, for example, I, I want to say, in Spain there is a contradiction, because if a businessman want to hire a foreign worker, what they want to do is, what they have to do is, they have to make an offer to the Spanish embassy, the Spanish consulate in another country, and make the, select, the selection process there, in the other country. Mm -hmm. So now in Spain we have more than two million undocumented immigrants. So why can't we do it to them? With this policy, there is a special process of organization with no longer exist. So why can we do that? It's a question that I have to make. It's, I don't know how it's the issue here. In the so this was, this was a document from the European Council? So typically, documents in the European Council then have to be made into national law in each of the 27 countries. Yes. So there'll be a two-year period or so where, and maybe Spain will not approve it, and then we may have an opting out uh, situation, huh? Well, no? But so the, the, about, uh, the council approved it, or the yes. national governments approved it? Right. Mm -hmm. right. Right. That's what he said. Right. And our topic today is our policy issues, which gives us broader scope than just being stuck to one policy or an official policy, because it's also the development of that policy, the changes of policy environment, and other things that go into this. We have another question. Yes. Um, I feel like there's not enough. Um, attention being put on the family reunification and the problems that really exist within that. Often when I read or um, you know hear speakers about immigration policy, they address it almost as a non-problem, like it is the quickest way to, to become documented in the United States. Um, with my personal experience, I guess I've become painfully familiar with how um, complicated the process really is. Um, I married four years ago with uh, a Mexican immigrant who was undocumented, who had entered the uh, country without documents while um, he was still a minor, so um, not of his own will, actually uh, under the seat of a truck when he was 16 years old. Um, after coming to the country and, and uh, turning 18 years old, uh, then our laws hold him responsible for returning himself to Mexico, which he did not do because he now uh, was established and living in this country, uh, never broke a law other than the entering and the uh, working in the United States without documentation. Um, and we were married for three years uh, with a two-year-old son when he was forced to leave the United States uh, to return to Mexico because of that illegal entry that occurred when he was 16 years old. Um, 
I feel like uh, as I come familiar with families who are actually going through the process, it is much more complicated and much more troublesome than what I think uh, a lot of the current uh, media would portray it. It's, it. As I would talk to people, they would say, oh, well, once someone gets married to a U.S. citizen, they're fine. They're not fine. It's still a big problem. A close friend of mine, similar situation, her husband was forced to go back to Mexico. Ciudad Juarez, um, which is known as a very dangerous city, uh, was then shot and left his three uh, U.S. citizen children here in, in the United States without a father. I just think it's a, a much bigger problem than what people recognize, and I was wondering if anyone had any more insight on that. Wow, what, may I, I, my, um, you know, the, for sure, the fact, that, you know, legally, right, in terms of the policy, the having that background on, on in his own personal life is one of, which is completely, of course, uh, again, out of his control. That is something that, that uh, again, issues like that that are very specific within families and circumstances are the kinds of things that, I, that definitely need to be addressed. And even while my presentation today, you know, is, uh, again, I focus just on something that uh, is uh, not allowing the process to continue in terms of, well, what would be next right now? And I'm, I'm curious about what my colleagues think in terms of what's next, in terms of the, what, what is it going to take to, to bring comprehensive uh, immigration. And, uh, and then, so that then they would look at those families, family circumstances. Even that remark, as you know, you know, it is not, uh, again, if, if I, was th I was thinking about your, your husband if, as if he was a student here. Uh, or, you know, because you said, uh, when, when did he come to this country? Um, he entered. Um, How old was he? He was 16. Oh. Um, entered. Uh, worked here in a restaurant, actually. Um, we went through the legal process, and he was um, approved. The problem is that when, um, just a little background, when you enter illegally, you become ineligible. Yeah. So even though he was approved... Uh, he, he was, was then, approved by whom? Uh, he was approved. Our family-based uh, mm -hmm. immigration uh, application, the I-130, was approved. At that point, had he entered illegally and overstayed his, his yeah. visa... Um, it then would have just been a process of going for, um, you know, going to uh, have his medical review done and everything and, and received his, his temporary residency. Um, but the act of entering illegally yes. makes him ineligible for that adjustment of status, which then um, led to a much longer process and eventually having to go back to Ciudad Juarez, where um, it's a much longer process to then uh, ha have him approved to return. and. Um, in your, many cases, it is impossible. Your point about, I mean, you give a human side of the story, and also you illustrate very well how complicated the reunification uh, process is, in fact, and uh, there's a huge lag uh, with it also. Uh, so I think, again, maybe you can talk afterwards longer yes. about the specific yes. case, but uh, it just illustrates that there are many gaps in these policies, and, and the different perspectives are very important. What do we do about uh, the, what we call human security of the people who are here, documented and undocumented? Uh, how does it uh, affect the societies both ways? What about mm -hmm. this huge issue of remittances that many people are talking about and even promoting uh, migration for these days because of the hope of using this privatization of development aid to, to bring money into a developing country? So uh, a lot of potentially interesting, stimulating issues that uh, we hopefully can get into some more. But I think today we've seen already from the perspectives of just a little bit of these different aspects. Uh, you know, I was curious issues. about the use of illegal immigrants, you know, in, uh, because I, the, the, we used to talk about illegal aliens. And I'm just wondering about the, the impact of U.S. discourse on, you know, on Europe regarding even the classification of this. Is there something, uh, maybe, Doug, that you can tell us about? about again, I, cause I, again I, I just would like to know what you guys think, because is the alien term as a category not no. used? No. 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 It's, you know. this, what it typically is used is this uh, term I use, mm -hmm. third country nationals. Yeah. And I'm not sure what the second country is. <laughs> <laughs> but the third country nationals are the... Uh, uh, Different languages, yeah. different, right? In France, sans papier, the one, the undocumented. Right, but those are sort of unofficial terms. Mm. Yeah, to, so, so yeah. alien has not been used alien in Europe. Alien not used now. No. Really? No. I mean, even in the early 20th century, or. It's, uh, it's no, not. I don't think 
It does, it that's really well. That's really interesting. Very important. The one one common theme right. that seems to emerge is that there seems to be attempts to criminalize the behavior more in both the EU and the United States. I don't know mm -hmm. if you want to comment on. Uh, if any of you are interested in gender discussion more, there's a UN subgroup called INSTRA that is having a virtual online discussion. Uh, they've already had one about gender and migration and remittances, and they're going to have one on getting gender issues into immigration policy coming up very soon. So you can contact me if you want more information on that. They're, it's certainly open to people to participate in. Uh, but one of the things that came up in that first discussion with INSTRA was the EU directive of last summer, which seems to uh, approve incarcerating people for six to 12 months if they're undocumented uh, immigrants into the EU and don't leave. Uh, so would anybody like to comment more? And do you see this as a common direction? To, uh, I think it is. Uh, the, uh, you may notice from my, my timeline, one of the very first things, once the EU started getting serious about trying to come up with a uh, uh, unified policy, one of the very first things they worked on was repatriation uh, before they worked on um, reunification mm -hmm. or any of the humanitarian things. The first thing they wanted to work on was repatriation and how to unify that policy. Uh, there were some really disgraceful um, really prison camps uh, that mm -hmm. sprung up. Uh, there was a very famous one in France right outside the uh, entrance to the Eurotunnel uh, that uh, finally became so embarrassing the, uh, the French government had to, to do something better. But all the time there are uh, uh, raids. And I and think you're right, the criminalization of, of immigration. At the same time, um, the countries are desperate for the work that's being done by the illegal immigrants, and, and, and nobody wants to admit that, uh, or uh, only rarely do we, do we admit that. So. You know, I think it's interesting regarding the criminalization uh, of it. You know, one thing is to, uh, in Mexico you also can go to prison, technically speaking, if you is, stay and you come back. Uh, in the, but prisons in Mexico are over, overcrowded for one, and, but in, you know, in, in, in the law, under the law, you know, they, that language is used, the criminalization of it, of, of, uh, of, of immigrants who, uh, again, uh, repeatedly would come. Um, and in any aspect of, of uh, any transgression legally might give, might give a reason to imprison them, you know, not just in terms of, you know, they're being foreigners. But it seems to me that, uh, I mean, if we think about IRCA since 1986, the criminalization occurred uh, in re with regards to the employer. I mean, they were going to be held accountable legally if they were to hire the uh, un undocumented. And right now, it is obviously both. You know, the problem is that, okay, yes, they, the law didn't do its job, people continue to get away with this. But now the criminalization, so what I'm saying is that there's something very specific about criminalization that happens in specific moments. And uh, the reason I devoted some time to uh, Sanson Brenner's own participation in this, and of course the document is, is you know, it's, it's about substantial, it's quite substantial, there's a lot there. But uh, my, you know, the, the targeting of certain practices as criminal, it's actually very, again, very specific and I feel that, I wonder again about you know, uh, the process of, and not only that, but who is being criminalized. Uh, that group in particular, I mean, Mexicans, you, you know, that's a, a code, I mean, legal is code for, a, you know, for Mexican in many cases. And obviously that has impact on everybody, everybody. Ultimately, it's not just Mexicans who get affected, obviously. Uh, and that's why we should all, we all should care about that. But I wonder about, again, you know, in, in other cases, like in Mexico, the targeting of a whole community, for example, you see, is almost, again, you know, it has a very different history of, uh, of, of immigration. It's more, you know, it's not in that sense of the targeting. So I just wonder, again, the role that, that communities play in being targeted or how they are targeted, you know, within Europe being, especially with the immigrants who come from what previously colonized countries, for one, or they might, in the case of Spain, we talked about this briefly, they're getting a lot of the people from North Africa, and uh, you know, in the case of uh, of, um, of France, you know, or even you know, England, who 
which also, who also colonize Africa. What happens to those populations? You know, I'm just thinking in general in terms of the EU in Europe. And because I am concerned now that if we, it's not always a matter of, of course, of a particular ethnic communities, but I just wonder if, uh, if you, in talking about just immigration law, as it applies to behavior, whether that behavior is just, again, personalized, like in the case of the women or gender, or whether the gender, the women, and their ethnicity matters, you know, as well. So anyway, I think these are questions that have to do with, with, uh, with policy that I, that I care about tremendously, because they have an impact on everyday life, ultimately. So do you have a last comment that you want to make? I was, uh, uh, I'm an immigrant to this country, and uh, I got married and had to wait for a year before I could um, get my green card, same thing. Um, but uh, I was surprised when I returned to um, Germany, a country I grew up in, as an American, um, which was an interesting experience in itself, to uh, see that uh, Germany is a country wrestling with this within the EU. Um, and uh, to find out that the number of uh, undocumented uh, workers there is actually very low. It's actually much lower than in the United States, proportionately. Um, and uh, the policies are um, somewhat uh, more forgiving, actually, than in the US for legalization. Um, but the climate for immigrants, um, social and cultural, is chilly, to um, put it mildly. And a chilly social climate really keeps people away. I'm, I really believe that um, there were you know, things that are difficult to measure demographically that uh, made people um, go move on to France or to England rather than to linger in Germany. Um, so that is something to remember that, uh, about who we are here. OK, well, I'd like to thank our panel and of our forum, and thank all of you for coming. Mm -hmm.